Uh, Revelation chapter 11. <clears throat> Something that I, I did not do, and it just occurred to me just a few minutes ago. Um, I'll explain it as we, as we read this in Revelation 11. I've got one through four up here, but we're going to read south of that uh, as we go along. Um, there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles in the holy city, shall they tread under foot forty and two months which is also uh, 1,203 score days. We'll read that. I will give power unto my two witnesses. They shall prophesy 1,203 score days, clothed in sackcloth. That's got to be uncomfortable when you think about it. Sackcloth is pretty rough stuff. But uh, compare that now. And, and this is how... It's similar to how John the Baptist was clothed. He wore a camel uh, skin coat and uh, ate locusts and wild honey. And what you don't see on either John the Baptist or these two witnesses is a uh, $3,000 suit, amen, and a Rolex watch. Ray Stevens put out a song several years ago called Would Jesus Wear a Rolex? And uh, I don't know if y'all ever heard it. It's been a long time since I heard it. I don't remember the words to it. But he was, he was poking fun, but he was being serious about all these televangelists that are just raking in millions and millions of dollars uh, all in the name of God or in the name of Jesus. And these people... And I say people, they're male and female both. They qualify under the warnings that are given to us in the book of Jude and uh, 2 Peter concerning the false prophets uh, of the last days. They qualify for that. In fact, I may go there in a little bit. We're gonna, we, we'll contrast these two um, good prophets of God with the false prophets of the last days. Uh, in verse 3, well, no, verse 4, he says, These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them. And I want you to think about this. This is, this is neat to me. These men are going to have the ability to shoot fire out of their mouth. I think that... As a, as a kid who grew up reading comic books and watching science fiction movies and uh, all of that stuff, I can tell you that that looks neat to me. Okay, these two men that have the power that if you cross them uh, or try to hurt them in either way, they just open their mouth and shoot like Godzilla. They just shoot a big ray beam of fire out of their mouth and it'll consume whatever or whoever that they happen to be aiming it at, uh, that, that tells you that they mean business. The nearest I can come to doing that is to open my mouth and let the Word of God proceed out of it uh, in somebody's direction. Uh, I've got a little bit of that planned for this morning. You pray for the message, because uh, it's... Um, I'll go ahead and tell you, I'm going to preach on hypocrites this morning. And um, just, just, there's people in mind, not necessarily here right now, but there are people that I have known over the years that I've been alive on this earth that to me just stood out as being hypocrites. Um, so anyway, if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth. And devoureth their enemies, and if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. If they try to shoot them, they'll shoot back. If they try to hang them, they'll be hung. If they try to kill them with the sword or the spear, that's how they will be killed. Uh, these ha and what will happen is people will be afraid 
to do anything to them. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood, reminiscent of Moses. Uh, the previous part in verse 6, reminiscent of Elijah. So that kind of leads me to believe that it's possible that we could be talking about Moses and Elijah as these two witnesses. Some people say Enoch and Elijah. But Elijah definitely is in there. There is a prophecy that specifically speaks Elijah's name that he will return in the last days to prepare the way of the Lord. And uh, so anyway, uh, they have power over waters, turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Again, reminiscent of Moses. And when they shall have finished their testimony... The beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Now, take your Bible with that in mind and look at Revelation 13. If you look in verse um, 6 of Revelation 13, he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God. Uh, that's what Goliath did, and that's what got David so stirred up, made him mad. How dare this uncircumcised Philistine defy the armies of the living God? And um, I, think, I think Goliath even cursed David by his gods to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him, here it is right here, it was given unto him to make war with the saints. Well, here's two of them uh, in verse 7. Interesting. Um, matching this verse 7 in Revelation 13. It was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. If you look in um, verse 4, Revelation 13... They worshiped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Two things that are on the horizon right now as far as man's inventions. One of them is, of course, artificial intelligence, which is growing in its knowledge and its understanding daily in leaps and bounds. It's not just growing in a small way. Um, if you ever use what they call Chat GPT, which is a website you can go to, and you can literally ask a computer practically any question you want. There are limitations. In other words, they put rules down. Um, you can't, how, what, it, what is it? You can't ask chat GPT, you can't ask the computer uh, to say anything that could be like libelous against somebody or whatever. But um, I did this as an experiment. I took this down to Brother Reg Kelly's church. He asked me to do this. And I put in a question about how the blood of the lamb sprinkled on the doorpost and the lintel back in the book of Exodus was a foreshadowing and a prophecy of the blood of Christ and its atonement for sins. I asked it to give me 500 words and it was like I was reading a systematic theology textbook. And it was 100% right. I read it to a group of preachers and church people down in Norwood two years ago without telling them where it came from, and they all amended it. They said, that's exactly how it is. That's perfect. That's spot on. And then I told them, no man wrote this. A computer, in about five seconds, threw this answer back at me in literally perfect Theology, perfect doctrine. And I was pretty amazed at it. So we have artificial intelligence that has access to 
what really is an unlimited source of information, knowledge, and its ability to put things together. That's what really sets humans apart from all of the other creatures is our ability, vast ability, to put two things together and understand how they work. We can, if some company comes up with uh, some new engine that reduces gas usage by 10 gallons or whatever um, per tank, some other company can take that motor, take it apart, and understand what makes it work the way it does. We have the ability to do that. And so, so does this artificial intelligence. It has the ability to take two separate things and figure out a way to put them together and understand it. That's one part. The other thing is the realm of what's called quantum computers. Quantum computers are explained like this. Um, a car is not a better version of the refrigerator. Does that make sense? They didn't build a better type of computer. They built something entirely different than the standard computers that you and I use every day. So that's the comparison that they give. It has the ability and this is sound, going to sound bizarre, but I understand it a little bit. It has the ability to tap into um, an entirely different realm of existence. An entirely different universe. Uh, we would call it in the Bible the spiritual realm. It has the ability to use the resources of a higher dimension than you and I exist in to get its answers. There is a certain, it's a pretty simple formula. It's only about this long on a chalkboard. But they say that in order for a standard computer to come up with a solution to this formula would take 10,000 years. They have already ran this formula into a quantum computer. It took about 38 seconds and came up with the answer. When it plays chess, it doesn't look at the possible moves one step at a time in a very fast way. It has the ability to look at all of the moves all at once. And you will never, ever be able to beat it, ever. They are starting to use quantum computers to do what's called cryptography. When, you're, when you put in your bank information and you go to connect to your bank using your phone, your bank's computer scrambles the information that you put in to make it difficult for someone to steal your bank account information. It's not impossible but it's difficult. With quantum computers, they can scramble it in such a way as that nothing ever, ever, ever in a million years would ever be able to unscramble it. So we're talking about the ability to hide things and keep them secret, and nobody but God would be able to ever figure it out. The idea is, is that when these two things merge, artificial intelligence and quantum computers, you and I are in trouble. This world, as it is now, will cease to be and it will be an entirely new world order. Entirely. I can't even begin to describe how different things are going to be. But clearly... We already, with artificial intelligence, we already, no human can beat them in any kind of war game scenario, whether it's checkers, chess, 
a Japanese game called Go, some of these, um, some of these war video games that people play for a living. I never thought I'd see a day when people would be playing video games for a living. I always told my kids, don't play those things all day long. You'll never be able to make a living playing video games. Boy, was I wrong. They're millionaire video game players. Millionaires. It's crazy. But anyway, um, we already are in a world where artificial intelligence will beat every human on the earth at any war game scenario that you can throw at it. So we already have the fulfillment of who is like unto the beast and who is able to make war with him. And so it's this beast that these two witnesses are finally brought down. Um, back in Revelation eleven seven, 7, when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And again, in Revelation 13, 7, um, to him was given power, uh, to him was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. And then back in verse 4, who is like unto the beast and who is able to make war with him? When, when the two come together, artificial intelligence and quantum computers, uh, it will be game over for humanity the way it stands now. Uh, put simply, earth is running out of time, and people that you know are running out of time to get their life in order and to get their heart right with God. Can I get an amen out of somebody this morning? Everybody that you know that, uh, and you can say, well, most people I know go to church. Don't count on that as being their salvation. Don't count on church going as being their salvation. I grew up around people who went to church. And I can tell you right now, in some of their lives, you would have never know it. Right now, you'd never know that they ever went to a church a day in their life. Um, so time is running out. Time to get sober. Time to wake up. Uh, time to stand on the things that we really believe in. And time to trust in the Lord. Uh, I want you to take your Bible now. Turn to uh, 2 Peter. Yeah, 2 Peter chapter 2. Let's compare these two prophets of God, these two witnesses, with what the Bible refers to as false prophets and false teachers. There were false prophets also among the people. Somebody give me, name for me, a, an illustration out of the Bible of someone who you would categorize as a false prophet or a false witness of some kind. Anybody have a Bible story about a false prophet? Anybody in? That's kind of difficult. Do what? Yeah, all the time. All the time. Um, you don't have to turn there, but in Ezekiel 13 and Ezekiel 24, uh, God talks about the prophets. And in verse 4, he says, Thy prophets are like the foxes in the desert. Remember what John the Baptist called Herod? You fox, that fox. And he said, You have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. And he said, they have seen vanity and lying divination, which is typical of a lot of modern churches. They teach vanity. They give lying divination. Um, I was going through some old notes yesterday, uh, thinking about what to preach on down in Lebanon. and came across... Uh, man by the name of Andy Stanley. That is Charles Stanley's son. If Charles Stanley stood here, Andy Stanley stands way on the other side of that door. 
I mean, they are completely different. Andy Stanley had a teaching that I saw in my notes yesterday, reminded me of it. He said, for all the preachers out there who take the Bible and in their preaching and teaching go verse by verse by verse through the scriptures, he said, that's cheating. And he said, it's signs of a lazy preacher because doing that will not help you to grow people. That's a lie. It's an, that's how his dad did it. He was a, I mean, he, I, I don't agree with several things that Charles Stanley stood for and that he did. He changed Bibles, number one, I know that. But um, one of the things he was known for was his ability to go line upon line in Scripture. Precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. And um, you really couldn't point to him and say that he never used Scripture in his teaching because that's what he did. But that's basically him saying that against his own father. And he said this before Charles Stanley ever died. I wonder how those two got along in life. Uh, but that's, that's how he was. They've seen vanity and lying divination. So what do you give people if you can't give them the Word of God? What do you do in a 30 to 40 minute sermon every Sunday? What do you, what do you teach them? You, teach them? you have to teach them humanistic philosophy have teached them out of your own mind or your own heart. And that's what God said here. They've seen, they've not seen, uh, have you, they've seen vanity and lying divination, saying the Lord saith, and the Lord hath not sent them. And they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. Have you not seen a vain vision? And have you not spoken a lying divination, whereas you say the Lord saith it, albeit I have not spoken? Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because you have spoken vanity and seen lies, therefore, behold, I'm against you, saith the Lord God. My hand shall be upon the prophets that see vanity and that divine lies. They shall not be in the assembly of my people, neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel. That means their name is not in the book of life. And I've been chewed out by people saying, Brother Mike, you shouldn't go against guys like that because they're brothers in Christ. And you're supposed to go to them privately first. They're not brothers in Christ. Not when, they, not when they say things like they say about the word of God, like Andy Stanley did. Now, go back to 2 Peter chapter 2. There were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. So the Bible's telling you that if you want to understand the nature of false prophets in our day, look in the scripture. That's why I, I had you... Try to think of a place where there was a false prophet in the Bible. How about uh, Elijah and the prophets of Baal? There you have 400 prophets who are supposed to be calling down fire from Baal. And they spend all day not being able to do it. They cried, they screamed, they hollered. They began to cut themselves, blood was running all over the place, and yet they were not able to, uh, and, and Elijah was making fun of them too. That's the kind of part, that's, I like that stuff, making fun of them. What is your God, uh, is he out pursuing? Is he, is he asleep? Is, is Baal asleep? Well, can you wake him up? And he was making fun of them that way, and that made them mad. But anyway... Back in uh, 2 Peter, uh, privily shall bring in damnable heresies. That means they, they will not just stand up and tell you their false doctrine outright. I've noticed, I would watch some of these guys on TBN, Creflo Dollar and, and Kenneth Hagan, Kenneth Copeland and so on, and they all seem to have the same method. They wouldn't start out at the beginning declaring unto you where they were going with their teaching. They always had to twist scripture. So they would give the scriptures first. Then they would spend some time telling you how they would twist or rest the scriptures 
and then lead you to a conclusion that they themselves wanted you to have. And generally, it was generally about healing or money. Talk about what if, as a church, we decided there was only one hymn out of our hymn book that we thought was right with God, and the rest of them we weren't going to sing. So Melissa would come in every Sunday, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and we would sing the same hymn over and over and over and over again. Well, that's what they do. It's the same song every time, and it's always about money. And Jim Baker actually exposed this. He wrote a book. Um, he actually wrote a couple books while he was in prison, and one of them, uh, I had a copy of it. I don't know if I still have it. But he said when he was um, the, the preacher there for the PTL club, he had a staff that wrote the sermons. And he said they would figure out some new way of getting people to call in, give us their credit card number, or mail in a check. We would figure out the way to get them to do that. Then we would write an outline of the steps that we would teach them to bring them to that same conclusion. Then we would ransack whatever Bible we could that said something close to what we were trying to do. And he said, we never read the scriptures first and then came up with a sermon it was always the topic first and it was a method on how to get the most money out of people usually coming in the form of some promise that God makes in the scriptures and that promise is according to them that God wants you to be healthy and God wants you to be wealthy like they are and you can be wealthy like they are but you have to give your money to us in order for it to be that way. Yes, ma'am. It is manipulation. It sure is. Uh, the Apostle Paul said that they rest scriptures. W-R-E-S-T. That's like where we get the word wrestling from. And it's to twist it around like you would Play-Doh to make whatever you wanted to make out of it. And a lot more than just the prosperity preachers do that. Uh, but anyway, they bring in damnable heresies, denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Verse 2, many, many shall follow their pernicious ways. That's why Joel Osteen's church runs about, what, 40,000, 50,000 on a Sunday morning? He's so big that he had to buy a basketball stadium uh, in downtown Houston in order to do it. And uh, to think that he took, takes all this money in and to think that you could ever expect him to give it over to the poor, well, that's not going to happen. And he proved that. when What was that hurricane that went through? And, huh? Katrina that flooded out Houston. And uh, the people were expected to go to the government for help. But Joel Osteen was criticized at the time because he wasn't offering any help. He... They could have opened up that church to let people stay in there so they would have a, a shelter over their heads because their houses got flooded out and he wouldn't allow it. No, that's his money studio. That's where he's going to do his big TV productions and he can't have a bunch of homeless people in there dirtying the place up. And so he got criticized for that. Um, Many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Mark this down. That means they will always denounce the King James Bible. They will speak evil of it. And so, again, that, just, that doesn't limit itself to the false teachers. It goes to anyone who says the King James is not the word of God, or they say it's really, that's old-fashioned and it's full of mistakes, full of holes. We've proved it, and so we just don't use it anymore. 
um, they will speak evil of the King James Bible, and I know how they talk because I used to be one of them, and they will speak evil also of the people who believe the King James Bible. In verse 3 it says, And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. You are a commodity to them. You're not a soul that needs salvation. You're not someone that they feel sorry for and they want to try to help you and they have compassion toward you. They couldn't care less. One of the scams that they run is they, they always want your mailing address. Once they get your name and address, they're going to bombard you with monthly and sometimes bi-monthly mail outs. You're going to get some nice letter that you think is written by Kenneth Copeland, but it wasn't. It was written by a staff, written by a group of people that work for him. You think that, that he signed all the letters. He didn't. That's a stamp or it's printed on there by the computer or however. But that three-page letter is designed to get you to mail in the biggest check that you possibly can. They don't even care if you go into debt. In fact, they have at times taught people that you're really operating in faith when you go out and borrow the money. Then you send it in, but don't worry. God then is going to pay off that debt and give you an overflow on top of it. And I just wonder how many people went out and borrowed tens of thousands of dollars and sent it in to one of these false prophets, then realized that they got suckered, they had to pay the debt off, or they had to declare bankruptcy over it. But not, not the preachers, not them. No, sir. Um, I think it's in, no, Jesus said it concerning the false teachers and the wolves in sheep's clothing of the last days. He said, they shall steal widows' houses. And there was a, um, an older woman. She was, she was left millions of dollars by her husband. And um, when she died, they found her last will and testament. And she, um, I think it was something like $5 million, $10 million, something like that. And she wrote in her will that all of that money was to go to Jimmy Swaggart Ministries. Now, this was back in the 80s. And so a check was sent to Swaggart Ministries. Well, her children were like, was there nothing for us? And according to the will, nothing. So they hired a lawyer and they got in contact with Swaggart Ministries and said, our mother... Uh, she was a follower of you, yes, but she was not really of her right mind in the last few years of her life. And we believe that she gave this money to you in error. Um, will you send it back? Because she left her children with nothing. Will you send it back? And we promise that we will, we will give you a generous portion of it. Swaggart wrote back, and basically said, go jump. It's ours. It's legally ours. We're going to keep it. And you can't have it. So they sued Swaggart Ministries over that money. They lost. The judge said, I can't do anything about it. You haven't proved that your mom was not in her right mind. The, the will is sound. We have to follow the will. It's legal. It has the force of law behind it. So Swaggart gets that money. Wasn't too long after that is when he got caught with all them hookers. You think God wasn't watching that? He stole that widow's house. He stole those kids' inheritance, and he paid the price for it. He sure did. And what's he up to now? Same thing. Doing the same thing. Same racket. Uh, taking in money all over the world and putting up radio stations and all this stuff. He's got a, I don't, this is the bell. Don't, don't watch Jimmy Swaggart. Don't, don't follow their ministry at all. Bunch of wolves in sheep's clothing. Amen. God's going to send two 
prophets, two witnesses in the last days. And we have the contents of their words right here in our book. Amen. Father, we love you and we thank you, Lord, for blessing us the way you have. Lord, we look to you for all of our help and our guidance. And Father, we pray, dear God, that in these days that we're headed into, Lord God, that you would not allow our feet to be moved. Father, you would enable our weak knees to continue to stand. God, that you would have mercy upon us and give us salvation, give us everlasting life, and help us to hold to these truths, Lord, in your holy word until the, till the last day. We pray this in Jesus' name, and amen.